So welcome. Welcome to our virtual legislative preview forum hosted by the Disability Caucus of the Iowa Democratic Party. My name is Julie Russell Stewart and I'm the current chair of the Disability Caucus. You will also be hearing from Vice Chair Eric Dunat at the end of our program when we go over next steps for being an advocate with disability issues. First, I would like to thank you all for being here with us. Your interest and presence means a lot to us as we try to navigate the upcoming session and pinpoint where we can make a difference in the lives of those living with a disability. Whether you are a lawmaker or a person with a disability or an ally, the fact that we're all here right now to take a good look at some of the issues is extremely heartening. And we thank you for taking the time to be here. A couple of years ago, I went, wanted to see a movie at the Des Moines Arts Center. But when I asked the filmmakers who were friends of mine, if it was captioned for the hard of hearing, they said no. I couldn't bear to stay home because as an artist, I was really wanting to see what they had put together on a subject that is close to my heart, which is a letterpress printing. So I got in touch with the museum just to see what I could do and whether they had any assistive devices for sound, only to find out over several conversations that the system there was so old, it didn't work. So we got busy helping them track down a rental system for the day. And they made a big effort to accommodate me and I was able to enjoy the movie with a loop system. I was also very pleased to learn later that they had purchased that system to replace the old one. And I felt ready, and they felt ready to accommodate anyone else that would need it. All this by simply asking for ADA compliance. Back then, I never would have imagined that I would be here tonight talking about advocating on the state level for people with all kinds of disabilities, both visible and invisible, because it's a pretty big group in Iowa. People with disabilities are the largest minority group in Iowa. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations with our legislators and advocates. I want to give you a brief introduction to what our Disability Caucus is about. We're one of 12 constituency caucuses in the Iowa Democratic Party. Tonight, you will hear from two other caucuses on our forum, Veterans Caucus and the Native American Caucus. We're all charged with representing the needs of our constituencies to the Iowa Democratic Party and the state at large. We cover topics like voting accessibility and issues that we want to see addressed by our lawmakers that are particular to us. We talk to candidates and keep the conversation going when they get elected. We enlarge our membership and register new Democrats and put on events like this one to share why we are advocating for a more supportive network. Throughout this forum, you may notice that all of these topics are interconnected. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted where our systems are failing us. For example, one of our caucus members was enrolled in Medicaid several months ago and made an appointment in October to see a provider for mental health, but was not able to get in until January. You can imagine this is not good for anyone's mental health. There's a shortage of trained healthcare providers who accept Medicaid. Why is this? What can be done? What needs to change? These are questions we hope to make some progress on. A person I know who needs in-home care is relying on her parents for most of it now because of the risk of bringing the virus into the household. Another caucus member brought his disabled wife home in February from a facility because he was worried that the virus was going to explode there. I guess you could say he was right. But now he worries about what would happen to her if he were to get sick. It's an extremely fragile state of being for many of us right now. We need a good hard look at what the COVID crisis is revealing to us about our systems and about our priorities. All of these issues are interconnected and we need to pull on the strands and weave this into a supportive network. This will also strengthen the overall network for everyone, disabled or not. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, 
I will be simply reading your names off. And if you feel like being on camera or want to say hi, I'm just gonna say, I'm so glad that we have them on tonight. We're gonna to be hearing from Senator Pam Yoakum, Senate District 50, uh, Senator Rob Hogue, Senate District 33, Representative Timmy Brown Powers, District 61, Representative Eric Charity, District 67, the Chairwoman of the Veterans Caucus, Shelley Servadio, Veterans Issues Lobbyist Bruce Beeston, Rayma McCoy McDeed, Executive Director, Director at Central Iowa for Independent Living, Sarah Young Bear Brown, Native American Caucus Vice Chair. Um, and we are going to have a, an appearance by Rita Hart actually within this forum. And our moderators will be Alex Waters, council member of, in Sioux City, and CJ Peterson, former candidate for Iowa House Senate District 6. Before I turn the mic over to our moderators, I want to remind you that we're having a Q&A session toward the end of this. We're taking questions from the audience from the comments in the YouTube live stream. So as you're going along and listening to this forum, please write them in as you think of them. And if we can't get to all the questions tonight, we'll forward them to the panelists and give you an update at a later time. Thank you very much. Our moderators, C.G. Peterson and Alex Waters, will be starting with our questions. Thank you very much for the introduction there, Julie, and for all of the work that you do uh, leading the uh, Iowa Democratic Party Disabilities Caucus. Um, it, it's an extraordinary job you've done uh, gathering all the uh, the best and the brightest here on this, on this call. Um, I uh, Again, my name is CJ Peterson. I am the chairperson of the Carroll County Democratic Party, um, and I was the uh, Democratic nominee for the Iowa Senate in District 6 this year. Um, I uh, have, uh, I am uh, a person who um, is hearing, uh, hard of hearing, um, it is hereditary. Uh, my grandparents were deaf and my brother is uh, deaf as well. Um, all of them attended Iowa School for the Deaf. Um, so uh, a lot of these issues are, are very important to me and to my family members. And uh, I, I became intimately involved with the Disabilities Caucus uh, as uh, you know, I got to know those folks uh, over my my campaign for for office, and uh, since then um, have uh, stepped up my advocacy because as it turns out, I'm, I'm not going to the state house in January, so I have a lot of time to devote to to these issues. So, um, and so we're going to get some things done, uh, whether I'm walking up the steps of the Capitol uh, as a legislator or as an advocate. So um, tonight is about uh, all of you uh, watching um, and. Uh, the, the legislators who have joined us, I do want to thank you as well. Uh, but there, there are a lot of folks who, you know, ran for office and didn't make it, but, but you're here and your constituents chose you. And um, our job as the Disabilities Caucus of the Iowa Democratic Party is to, uh, to help, uh, help you um, pass uh, items uh, in the legislature that, that are going to be conducive to making life better for people with disabilities in the state of Iowa. Um, and that's, that's a wide array, array of people. Um, it includes veterans, it includes, you know, folks with uh, moderate incomes or low incomes. Um, and, and it just affects everybody. So uh, with that, uh, I do want to uh, welcome my co-moderator this evening, uh, Alex Waters. Uh, Councilman, uh, you want to take it away? Yeah, CJ, I really appreciate that. Um, I, and it, you're a tough act to follow. So I'm glad I get to share the stage with you and, and have your help throughout this time. But um, as CJ said, my name is Alex Waters, uh, originally from Okaboji, so the northwest corner of Iowa. And then I moved to Sioux City in um, uh, back in the day to go to college, uh, actually in 2008. I, that's when I really got thrust into this world of uh, disability advocacy and became disabled myself. I was 18 years old. 
um, and a freshman at Morningside College in Sioux City when I, I traveled back home with some friends. We decided to go swimming and I, I dove into 18 inches of water um, and snapped my neck, became a C5, C6 quadriplegic. And so since that time, um, I, I had to do six months of rehabilitation, uh, ultimately went back to college, received my master's, moved to Washington, D.C., um, did some work with the American Association for People with Disabilities before returning back to Sioux City to work for um, the 2012 re-election campaign of Barack Obama and then Vice President Joe Biden, now President-elect, which I think um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. And um, so then I really, due to a couple other issues, really became involved and decided to run for office myself. Uh, as CJ and Julie both alluded to, I ran for office um, to be a Woodbury County Board of Supervisors and spoiler alert, I lost. So CJ, um, I think a lot of the greats lose their first one, right? Or hopefully that's the case. So keep trying, man. I think you're an incredible candidate. Uh, in 2017, then I ultimately ran for the city council of Sioux City, the fourth largest city in Iowa, and was elected at large. So um, that just got me really excited and, and thinking about the work um, that we can do and the difference we can make in one another's lives. So I'm really excited uh, to be here to um, having these conversations about disability advocacy, some of the issues that we are facing, some of the things that COVID-19 has shined a spotlight on in our state and ultimately have a conversation of what we can do moving forward. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of it. So thank you so much. All right, well, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into uh, the the forum here because the time is of the essence as we know. Um, and uh, so the first thing we're gonna talk about uh, this evening, um, and, and of course we have legislators and we have uh, you know people with disabilities and uh, advocates um, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, all, all hands on deck here as far as uh, getting um, getting these topics covered. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, the, the issues surrounding independence and, and education. So uh, we're going to kick this off uh, with one of the panelists here, as well as my co-moderator, uh, Alex Waters. Um, so as we know, income limits uh, with Medicaid uh, and the fiscal, fiscal cliff um, creates barriers to, you know, getting a good job, uh, you know, being married, um, you know, being forced to choose between a life of poverty or, or staying single just to keep our benefits. Um, can you talk a little bit about, Alex, uh, the situation and uh, the other aspects of independence uh, uh, that, that you may want to add or, or talk about here uh, to, to get us started here? And then we'll kind of uh, we'll, we'll bring Rayma uh, McCoy McDeed in as well. So, um, Alex, go ahead and uh, start us off here. Uh, how um, how has uh, has the availability or the, the rules surrounding benefits um, and income eligibility impacted your your ability to uh, remain independent or become independent? Yeah, I appreciate the question, um, CJ, and the topic really surrounding independence. This is one of those things that really um, forced my hand and really um, had me excited to start advocating and going down to the state house, having conversations, was to try to change some of these archaic rules that haven't been adjusted and things that just make sense, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. And so I started advocating on behalf because in January, I received a letter, um, it was what, two years back now, um, that said that my income had reached its cap and that they were taking me off of Medicaid effective in one month. So I contacted my home health provider. I asked what my options were, how much that was gonna be costing. And it was gonna be over $10,000 a month out of pocket um, just for me to be able to literally get up in the morning and go to bed at night and have a nurse come to my house to take care of those advanced skilled things three times a week. And so I went into scramble mode and figuring out what I could do. And the best option that I was given from elected representation, whether it was in Washington or in Des Moines, was that I needed to cut my pay. You see, I, I, I get paid a little bit of money for joining the city council and um, they, I had received a raise at work and it put me over that income threshold and um, what's lovingly called as the cliff effect. 
And so it pushed me over that threshold. I had to cut my pay just in order to continue receiving services to get up in the morning and go to bed at night. And it's one of those things where I try to have the conversation about independence, about what that means and say that, look, the more money I make, the more taxes I'm going to pay into, the bigger house I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna start my own business, do all those things. And our costs as Medicaid remain stagnant. They remain the same and level, you know, as far as what it's gonna cost for those services provided. Then I, I met a hey, wonderful woman um, that I would love to propose to someday, I would love to marry, and found out that then her income would actually be counted against me as well. And so now I'm forced to make a really hard decision of what I'm going to do. How does that look for my future? Do I just choose not to become married, to have that income count against me? We are by no means wealthy. Um, we make a very comfortable living, but it's one of those things where we are just we are just putting people with disabilities um, under this glass ceiling with an inability to achieve their true potential. And it's frustrating because we do as much as we can to get them started. And then, and then we tell them that's enough. Now you need to stop. And so it's something that really got me um, active, uh, frustrated, and um, I'm excited to have some elected officials here today um, to just have that conversation of what that cliff, cliff effect looks like, how we can increase some of those income limits. I know that in Colorado, their income limit is almost double what it is in the state of Iowa, and they have a law called the household of one, which means you only look to the person with the disability regarding um, their benefits received and their services provided. So that's just a brief little bit about my story and especially the independent side of it. Um, the last thing I would just say is another thing to consider when I want to be making more money, it's not just because I'm greedy and I need to accumulate as much as I can. I'm also thinking about the costs associated simply with living. I live in a very expensive power wheelchair. I'm looking at buying a brand new van and with um, modifications and things like that, we're talking it's close to seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 um, for a minivan. That's not for anything fancy, let me tell you. Um, but, but life gets expensive. And so just trying to remain independent um, and live in my own home and try to pursue as much as I can um, has been really frustrating. And, and the laws in place have really put a hamper on that. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Uh, so, so I really want to make sure um, as we're talking about this, that we talk about the way that this is kind of looked at as a as a medical issue rather than as a you know strictly a, a quality of life or an independence issue um an economic issue for for people living with disabilities and i, I can't think of anybody better you know we're, we're blessed here to to have uh rima uh rima here with us uh rima is the uh, executive director at the central iowa center for independent living and uh rima um how can we move away from sort of that that medical model when we're thinking about those these disability issues in our state um, and instead look at it as uh, you know a philosophy of, of independent living um, you know the the independent living model actually has lower costs I mean if we don't treat people as medical patients and we treat them instead as you know people who are contributing to our society how, how can we frame this or, or educate our legislators uh, or, or help move the needle at the Overton window or however you want to call it. Uh, Rima, what, what, do you, what would you say is the best way for us to kind of approach this uh, going forward into the legislative session? This is Rima talking. Thank you, CJ. Um, great question. Before I answer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this now, and then I'm going to pick it back up when we talk about disability justice towards the end of our time together. But I wanna do a visual description of myself for the folks that are listening along. Uh, I'm a 40 year old black woman, uh, long curly brown hair. I'm seated in a white room with the bookshelves behind me and I'm wearing uh, very rather ostentatious orange glasses and an orange t-shirt. Anyhow, uh, so the thing is is that so many mechanisms that are meant to provide services and supports to disabled people in Iowa and the US are based in the medical model. The, the context is that disabled people cannot be independent, certainly cannot have careers, will not ever get married, have children, et cetera, et cetera. And so we see this, this uh, bias against independence 
with regards to social security based benefits, SSI, SSDI, with regards to Medicaid. There are all these barriers to, to independence and they are systemically built into the system to be redundant, excuse me. The result is this, 1% of SSI and SSDI beneficiaries successfully work themselves off of benefits. Let me say that again, less than 1% of folks who are beneficiaries of SSI and SSD or SSDI successfully work themselves off of benefits. And the, the inconvenient truth is that systemically speaking, there are so many barriers to disabled people attaining that kind of success that many people along the way just give up and say, you know, it took me three years to get these benefits in the first place. You know, my, my case was denied several times before I finally was eligible for these benefits. I, I, I have a lot of fear about what would happen if I take a job that where I'm making too much money and I end up losing these benefits. What if I lose that job? Am I going to have to begin that process all over again? Well, heck, I don't want to do that. So I'm just going to do whatever it is I need to do in order to maintain my benefits. That is a tragedy. That leads to people who are well qualified to have careers, to be married, to, to be productive citizens in, in this country, to engage in those things. And the fact of the matter is, is that disabled people want, want to lead fulfilling productive lives just like everybody else does. And so with regards to, you know, how does that translate into legislative priorities? You know, let's, let's not even get started with regards to Medicaid, the fact that the, the, the Medicaid system in, in the state is completely privatized. I mean, that we could have a legislative forum completely devoted to that. But in building relationships with legislators, you know, reminding legislators that we want to be independent, we want, we want to be productive, but we also don't want to place our lives in peril. And so, you know, supporting, being a support, being, being becoming educated with regards to the, the, the somewhat grim realities of SSI and SSDI um, and, and of Medicaid in particular, because that, that since Medicaid is a state funded thing, that's really where we can, we can get the most support from, from lawmakers. And so, uh, reaching those conversations with lawmakers, um, lawmakers reaching out to us and asking us questions with regards to, you know, how, how all of this stuff impacts the day-to-day -day lives of disabled people. You know, this is, this is the first step in shifting the paradigm so that we are, we, we, we begin to focus less on the medical model as being the, dis the predominant experience of disabled people and shifting into looking at the disability community from the vantage point of a social model where life is not a medical condition just because a person is disabled. And with services and supports, uh, you know, ensuring that the largest marginalized community, not only in the state, but in the country and the planet is 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 able to tap into the the the, the pursuit of life liberty and, and all of that stuff just like everybody else does thank you very much Rima. i think that's that's such an important uh th those are all such such important points that you're making and um you know i, I think it's so so are there any specific uh bills in the legislature that uh, that you would point to from, from the last session or, or previous sessions uh, that you would like us to, to touch on as we go into the forum further or uh, anything that we should be, uh, I mean, other than, you know, we want to deprivatize the dang thing, but, <laughs> you know, that, that's something that's, you know, a larger issue, but. Um... Yeah, yeah, and this is Rima talking again. So 
And we've got, we've got some fantastic legislators here who've really been champions for um, doing what, what it takes, introducing legislation that will exempt waiver, Medicaid waiver participants from privatized Medicaid. And I, I, I know that probably to a certain extent, it almost feels a bit Sisyphean to continue that effort, but that, that as long as this is a state where Medicaid is privatized, that is a conversation that needs to continue. Those of us who are advocates, particularly those of us who engage in nonpartisan advocacy, you know, this is really our time to shine as far as building relation. And I know that this is a democratic function tonight, but the fact of the matter is, is that if we really wanna see some momentum as far as any kind of legislation pertaining to exempting waiver members from privatized Medicaid, we've gotta got to work across the aisle, so to speak. Anybody follows me on social media, you know that I say that like with rocks in my jaw, but anyhow, <laughs> it's something that has to happen. Um, and so that, you know, I, I think that, 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 that every legislative session until we are a state that is in a place where we can revisit how Medicaid is administered in Iowa is, is a conversation that needs to continue. I think that's exactly right. And, and I'm really glad that you brought that up because one of the things we talked about as we we're preparing for this forum was, you know, we can't just shout from the rooftops at the Democratic minority in the legislature because, you know, you can't pass something unless you have 50% plus one voting for it right now. And uh, so we're, it's going to require us to, to reach across the aisle and, and, you know, find good faith member, you know, folks uh, of good faith on the other side. Um, and, and I say other side, um, uh, very lightly. I mean, we're all on the same side. We're all, we're all, you know, Iowans and we're all Americans. So um, as far as that goes, uh, this is this is kind of a great time for us to kind of seg into the next uh, question I have here, um, and I want to bring in uh, our first legislator here, uh, represent, Representative uh, uh, Giardi. Um, you're you're a special education teacher, um, and and you've worked in uh, educational policy and leadership. Um, where do you see? the gaps um, here as far as that, because I, I think a lot of these these problems that, that folks experience as adults begin in the educational system um, and, and as when, when folks are disabled as, as children. Um, where do we see the gaps most in helping students with disabilities reach their full potential and what uh, what, what legislative priorities can in, uh, under this umbrella uh, can advocates pursue in this session? Uh, Representative Gary. Hi, uh, thank you very much, TJ, for the uh, the question. Um, I am, uh, for right now, until the 11th representative-elect, um, Eric Gary, and uh, the name is, is very difficult, and it's gonna take a long time for, for folks to get that, um, but uh, it, it's Gary. And I want to thank you for inviting me to this. I, I come to this conversation uh, through uh, multiple lenses. Uh, as you had mentioned, I've been a special education teacher in the state of Iowa for the last 20 years. Special education. Uh, I come through it uh, through the lens of being a father of twins who have uh, had uh, bilateral hearing issues uh, since birth and as a result have a phonologic disorder uh, that they're struggling with right now. Uh, they're in first grade and uh, have a, a, a difficult time uh, communicating, um, particularly with their peers and uh, folks that aren't with them. And then the, the last lens that I, I come through this is that I have a, uh, a family member uh, that within the last year we've dealt with uh, uh, mental health issues and, uh, you know, there, there weren't a, there weren't enough beds in Iowa uh, to help her, and uh, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, when we talk about education, you're exactly right. Um, what happens to young people really is uh, the the foretelling of their future and how we treat them as they're young and how we prepare them for the future um, ultimately tells their story. And my wife is an early childhood uh, educator in Cedar Rapids as well. And, you know, when we get home from work, we talk about, you know, the, the different challenges and that we have with students uh, each day. 
And it, it doesn't differ, Rob, whether I'm in high school or whether she's in early childhood and dealing with three and four year olds, we deal with the same struggles uh, daily. And a lot of that comes to, and, and it was mentioned, and I, I forget who mentioned it, but the lack of professionals uh, you know, that, that deal with, uh, you know, whether the physical therapist, speech language pathologist, occupational therapist, psychologist, uh, we have a shortage in the state of Iowa and we need to address that. Uh, we need to ensure that everybody who needs access to services has access to services. That's the first step that we need to do. Uh, as a high school teacher, uh, I deal with uh, uh, and teach, I would say 250 students um, in the program that I, I teach at at Jefferson um, each day in a, a typical school year. And it, it's been a while since I've been in high school, but uh, high schoolers have and they need mental health support. And too often, uh, right now, if they're having a mental health crisis, I, it's well, you know, we'll get you signed up, and hopefully, somebody will talk to you in the, you know, the next, you know, week or two or three weeks. Uh, that doesn't work. You know, a, a 16 or 17 year old is having a mental health crisis. They need to see somebody now. And, you know, I've worked a couple times in the last uh, couple of years with uh, somebody to come out to the school within the hour, and they've done a pretty good job with that. But that is an exception. Um, we have kids that just won't talk because they know that there's just not the support system intact in our school systems to help with that. Uh, that needs to be addressed. And then ultimately, just special education funding. Uh, we need to ensure that we have funding available for students and professionals and families to get them the support that they need in order to be successful. Uh, as I had mentioned, you know, my twin daughters have IEPs uh, uh, speech and um, we're being, they're being evaluated right now for literacy. Uh, you know, I, they're fortunate in that they have uh, two educators as parents. And uh, that's one of the big reasons why I decided I was going to run uh, for Iowa State House is because I've advocated for individuals with disabilities and their families every single day of my working life for the last 20 years. And I was having a hard time advocating for my own daughters when our insurance company kept saying, no, we're not gonna pay for their speech therapy because they were born with their hearing loss. They kept telling me had they lost their hearing because of an accident or an injury, they'd cover it. Well, that's one of the most asinine things I'd ever heard of in my entire life. Uh, folks need to find a way to be able to communicate. And if you can't communicate, it's very difficult to be successful. And uh, you know, the only way that they've learned and know how to communicate is through spoken language. And they need to be able to speak clearly so folks understand them. Uh, too often they came home and they were crying and I would ask them what's wrong. And they would say, our friends tell us that we speak Spanish. And I would love for them to be bilingual, but they're not. Uh, and you know, they're at the age now where they're understanding that it's different and you know we're working through that so I, I would say that you know education funding is absolutely critical for everybody um you know from folks that are in general education and special education an increase in public education funding is good for everybody you need to get rid of privatized medicaid and i know that's going to be very very difficult to do um but um education funding medicaid system and increasing our mental health care system in the state of iowa are absolutely critical Thank you very much, uh, Representative Elect. Uh, I'm just going to call you Representative Elect Eric. Uh, we we have Mayor Pete. We might as well have uh, Representative Eric, right? And, and just <laughs> uh, so so I, I I would definitely agree with that, uh, and I I appreciate that perspective because I I actually was a student with an IEP and uh, you know utilized uh, charity. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I. Uh, I utilized an IEP and, and had, uh, um, you know, worked with speech pathologist uh, as I was going through school as, as a hard of hearing student. And uh, so I definitely understand. And, and I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because um, it's so important to have those resources in our schools. And uh, so, so let's, let's look at that uh, from a perspective, uh, from the perspective of, of Medicaid and, and our caregivers. Um, and, and on this uh, particular topic, uh, I want to bring in uh, Representative uh, Timmy Brown Powers, um, 
we have a shortage of home health caregivers, um, partly because the pay rate is so low um, and, and partly because uh, a lot of those providers are not paid in a timely manner because of privatized Medicaid. Um, so it, it's harder to, uh, to have folks uh, um, you know, sign up for the job, really. And um, so, so I guess there, there are a couple of different uh, um, questions here. But uh, the first thing I, I want to ask about um, is, uh, do you think there's any room for, for moving on a $15 an hour minimum wage in Iowa uh, that does not uh, include any kind of exemptions for pe people with disabilities? You know, this session, I wish there was. Do I think that'll happen? No. Um, it definitely has the Democrat support going forward for something like that, um, but it does not have our counterparts support at all uh, across the board. Um, what we, what I really want to focus on, though, this session, and I don't know that we can get it done, though, but we really need to start paying our our caregivers. Um, so when we look at overall minimum wage, that includes everybody, right? And that that causes then all kinds of of conflicts and all kinds of arguments and, and folks that just won't agree to move in that direction. So I think that we need to start uh, carving things out. We tried to do that with Medicaid also. Uh, Senator Yoakum <laughs> uh, can, to, can vouch with that, but, but I think we need to start carving folks out. And one of the vital things that we know um, from a bipartisan standpoint is that our caregiver system we're, is not getting paid. Um, so, and, and they're not sticking, I mean, they're not gonna stay to, you get what you pay for. And you're not gonna stick to a job that pays you $8 an hour um, when you're giving your heart and soul to someone and you're not getting reimbursed and you can't, you've got to work another two jobs or go to school on the side and work another job just to make ends meet. Um, the folks that stay in this field are, are dedicated folks with, with probably significant others that kind of help fill in the gaps to pay the bills. Um, the folks that would love to stay in this job uh, at the end of the day, can't afford to because they can't pay their bills. Um, so I was just talking to a gentleman here in Northeast Iowa, um, and he lost his services through um, an agency. And why? Because the agency wasn't getting reimbursed by a mayor group. Um, so they pulled out. They, you know, they're not going to go. So he's paying through CDAC. Um, he's paying his workers. $13 an hour, uh, which he feels that in itself is ridiculous. Um, who on this panel can live off of $13 an hour and pay all of our bills, right? That's that's not realistic. And that's just a today issue that we're that I've been talking with with this gentleman about. So, you know, and it's sad. And um, I'll I'll kind of talk about um, Representative Jerdy kind of started to talk about, but it is a shortage of, of funding. It's a shortage of the programming and it's a shortage of staff. And why do we have the shortage of all of those? It's because it goes back to the number one thing, it's funding. Um, do we have a shortage of beds? No, we have a shortage of staffing, programming and funding. Uh, do we have a child mental health program? We have a structure that we put together two years ago. Has it helped a family in, in the state of Iowa yet? No. Why? It has no funding. Um, so everything kind of goes back to this, CJ, um, and those listening, is we've got to um, start working with our partners across the aisle and start carving pieces out to start getting some funding. And I'm not sure, you know, one big move doesn't seem to work. Um, getting angry on the floor doesn't seem to work. Sharing personal stories um, doesn't seem to work. So, you know, I, I think as legislators, senators and representatives, we're gonna have to start taking little pieces, you know, that to you and me really aren't much, but we might start being able to move that needle and, and we've got to start moving the needle. Um, we have not moved the needle in the six years that I've been there. This will be my seventh year in January, and we've not moved the needle at all. Um, it is like running into a marble wall and falling and getting up and going, okay, I'll do it again. Um, so we've got to start and, and, and to get through to our 
to our partners on the other side of the aisle to move that needle forward for persons with disabilities, persons with mental health, mm -hmm. our LGBTQ community, our minority community. I mean, really Iowa, if we look at all the areas we are lacking. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, would, I do wanna bring in, uh, this is CJ again. I do wanna bring in um, Alex Waters uh, to, I believe uh, he's going to ask a question of Senator Yocum on, on kind of continuing on this topic of Medicaid privatization. Yeah, Senator Yocum, I know you wanted to jump in um, and, and piggyback on that a little bit. I'll let you do that first um, and then we'll get to that question. So why don't you build off of kind of those, what we were talking about there. Sure, well, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, CJ. Yes, and just to piggyback off what um, Timmy just said, we have tried um, numerous times to do a carve out of the disabilities community from privatized Medicaid in the Senate. We were one vote short from making it happen, but it does go back to funding. And I would suggest that we figure out how we can uh, perhaps look at, well, we're going to have to work with the Hume, Health and Human Service Budget Committee in both uh, the joint committee, the House and Senate usually met jointly. I'm not sure if they're going to do that with COVID again this year, um, this coming session. But, but that's where all of the issues really start with. I mean, we can do all the policy in the world, but if we don't back it up with money, it's meaningless. So I, would, I was just going to jump in there and say we really need to start working um, the Education Budget Committee and the Health and Human Service Budget Committee. But we need to figure out what specifically um, we need to go after in terms of increased funding. It's not like Iowa doesn't have some money right now because we have over 300 million in just our ending balance and our rainy day funds are full. So, so we can start making some incremental gains in the state of Iowa, but we need to know where we want to start. And right now, I'm not sure what to say on that. So Alex, ask me your question. Well, I think, yeah, I think they, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you're okay. I think you wanted to take it a different direction, CJ, quick, was that right? Yes, yeah, so, so this is CJ again. We are going to, uh, of course, come back to Medicaid and privatization. Um, like we, uh, have, like has been said, uh, this is a topic that we could spend three hours on alone. Uh, but we do have uh, uh, a panelist this evening. I, I want to make sure that we get to her because, uh, on, and, and uh, one of our other advocates on this panel, um, before we, uh, before they have to hop off and run out, we run out of time here. So. Um, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit uh, um, because this was in a, a topic in the news uh, just last week um, in the uh, I, uh, the uh, the U.S. House uh, District Two contest, and um, it seems that uh, at least two voters uh, with disabilities uh, were disenfranchised as part of the recount uh, between. Uh, uh, Rita Hart and uh, Marionette Miller Meeks, and uh, we 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 in the disability community we're we're kind of aghast at that, and, and we really want to hear from Rita here. Um, and uh, Rita, first off, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be packing your bags and heading to Washington soon, but uh, that that remains to be seen, I guess. But um, can you tell us a little bit from your experience uh, just how important a person's vote is uh, and, and, and how, how it can end up being, uh, you know, how the accessibility issue can, can uh, that, that we know of at least two people uh, being disenfranchised in, in your, your contest. Um, and and do, you, do you think there's any action that can be taken by the legislature in this session? Uh, and, and Obviously, we know now. Uh, we we knew before, but we know even more now that every vote, you know, certainly counts. So, so Rita, go ahead and uh, talk to us just uh, just a moment here, and then we'll come back to the Medicaid issue after we get done with this uh, uh, the, the the voting access uh, question here. Sure. So, thanks, CJ, and and thanks everybody for allowing me. Just, I'm I'm going to be very brief here because I know you guys have a very ambitious agenda, and so I really appreciate Julie and Eric for for um, allowing me to come and uh, speak just for a couple minutes. It's an incredible forum and, and you're talking about so many issues that are so important. But to your point, CJ, yes, there's, 
you know, it's, it's really important that we all have the right to vote and that we fight very hard to keep that right to vote, but it doesn't mean much if, we, if our vote doesn't get counted. And so um, that's, that's the important thing here. And I know that you are, you are talking about a lot of issues that are so important to Iowans who are living with a disability. Um, and this is one of them. And so I appreciate the time to talk to you all tonight. Um, as you know, we're in this fight to make sure that every vote is counted. We have this petition that we um, sent to the house that talks about 22 votes um, that we believe should have been counted. They were cast legally and they did not count for various reasons. And, uh, and so we, we've gone through this process to um, appeal to the house so that we can have a complete recount because we know that there were a lot of things that uh, did not happen in the recount process that disenfranchised um, a lot of people. And so we're, we're making sure that we get that complete recount so that uh, people's votes actually do count. And so two of those votes that I think are very crucial are two uh, people of disabilities who um, live in Scott County, who took the time and the effort, and you know more than, <laughs> than anyone, just how much extra effort that takes when you're a person who's living with a disability to um, get to that um, voting place, um, make the contact that they needed to so that they could cast those curbside ballots went through the process, completed their ballots, handed it over to the, um, to the poll workers, and then those two votes did not get counted. And to me, that is such a tragedy. And so um, that's why what you're doing here tonight um, matters so much because we've got to advocate in order to make sure that, that um, people with disabilities are treated in a way that's respectful of their true rights, and in this case, their voting rights. So I'm just here tonight, I need your help. I need to, uh, to make sure that people know about this, that they understand this, and that they care too, that these votes are counted. So I'm hoping that some of you will be able to post about it on your social platforms, that maybe a few of you would be willing to write a letter to the editor, I'll bring it to people's attention, um, try to tell the story of how important this is. And so Julie has um, uh, my staff member's contact. His name is Riley. If you're interested, I hope that you'll reach out and mm -hmm. um, really appreciate any help that you can give to help us uh, make this case so that these votes are counted. Thank you very much for that, Rita. And, and you know, I, I, I was just thinking, uh, you know, if, uh, if Applebee's can get my curbside order right, uh, I think the government should be able to count my vote right, uh, my curbside vote correctly. So, um, so it true. seems like a, seems like the voting process should be a little more secure than running my, my debit card at uh, the Applebee's. But, exactly. um, you know, and, and that, that's what we're fighting for in, uh, in, in U.S. House District 2. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say, I think on behalf of everyone here, we wanna encourage you to keep on fighting and, and don't give up until every last vote is counted. Um, it's not over till it's over. So uh, keep it up and uh, we really appreciate uh, everything you're doing to keep it going, Rita. Appreciate that, CJ. Thank you so much. It's gonna take all of us to make sure that, that um, we get this message out that every person's vote does count and that we have to make sure of that. Exactly. Um, and, and we do have uh, on, on the, uh, one of the, uh, the panelists, uh, Sarah Young Bear Brown, um, actually, uh, has uh, has may have some some thoughts on on voting access for the deaf. Um, I don't know, if, Sarah, if you're ready to chime in here on this. Um, she's yes. nodding, so <laughs> she is ready. Yes, yes. Amber's going to be interpreting for me tonight. Okay, yes. Um, every vote matters, right? That being the goal. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the goal. Mm -hmm. You know, I was born deaf and I have been deaf my whole life. Um, I'm the vice chair of the Native American uh, Disability Caucus. And uh, I'm just really, really honored to be here with so many of you tonight, well, all of you really, <laughs> but um, I'm representing the deaf community this evening. And well, <laughs> A little nervous. Okay, so I just I know I'm trying to keep this brief, and I want to get it get it down to these bullet points that I had thought over. Now, 
This is the first time in history The first time I myself voted was in 2004. So let me back up there. Uh, sorry, this is the interpreter. We're having some screen clarity issues. But we need to get, uh, you know, the word out. We need to provide that training to folks about where the polling places are. How do you go about voting? Um, 2020 was quite a different experience for me entirely. Um, where every constituent in the uh, caucus, sorry, this is the interpreter. I, I'm not able to see Sarah well enough to be able to interpret. She says, what'd you miss? I said, pretty much everything. I'm so sorry. She says, okay, we'll back up. Okay, so back in 2004 was my first uh, voting experience. And um, I did not see a lot of ASL um, access for that voting, um, voting polls. There was no interpreters, things like that. Um, as far as the caucuses, when you, when you choose your, you know, who you want to represent you, um, there were, there was not access provided there. So I am seeing way more of that in this current year. Um, and this was actually the first time that we've ever been able to, uh, you know, finally get all of these services, including CART established. And that's impressive, but there's still a lot of struggle within the community. Um, when people are registering, uh, when they're first signing up for voting, they don't know really much about either of the parties. Um, you know, I tried to explain to them that I'm a part of all of that and tried to explain that it's uh, you know, the difference between independent, democratic, uh, Republican. And uh, there's a lot of lack of information within the deaf community that I've noticed. Uh, one second, let me please. And I feel like overall, we need to set up more, um, more visual access uh, for ASL users specifically, but in general, more visual access. Uh, we need more visibility on social media. We need more ASL provided on social media with our message. Uh, not just relying or, or forcing people to depend on captioning or on written word, but We need to be able to see the language. And if they're forced to rely on captioning alone, that does rely on, on the, the accuracy of the message itself. But we need to have that access in 2020. We can't really congratulate ourselves and say, hey, we did a great job in 2020, okay? Because we did not provide that access to everyone that needed it. So that is still a main goal in our efforts is to provide access to the deaf community. I, this is CJ again, and, and I would agree with you, Sarah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, one moment, CJ. Yes. I'm having, I'm, now I was having some audio problems there. I can hear you again clearly. Thank you. Sorry, it's the interpreter. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, and, and I, I was just going to say, you know, Sarah, I, I definitely agree with you that uh, we can't be satisfied with where we are right now and that there is a lot of work to do in ensuring you know, the right to vote for, for everyone, including, you know, uh, you know people who are deaf and, and, and other people with disabilities. And I, I think that that's something that gets so overlooked because we we focus so much on on issues like voter ID and things of that nature. But um, the Democratic Party and and you know the, this caucus really can do a lot more to educate folks about what it means to be a Democrat or what it means to participate in our democratic process. And that that's got to be something that we have to do um, going forward. So. Um, and, and thank you again, Sarah, for, for bringing those issues to the forefront. Um, and hopefully we'll have uh, some, some questions for you at the end if anybody uh, is asking in the YouTube channel. Um, and they can ask you a couple of questions if, uh, if anybody has some of those. So um, 
I want to, in the interest of time, I do want to okay. get back over to Medicaid privatization and uh, throw it back to Alex and Senator Yoakum here, if that's all right. Uh, Alex, are, are we are we still here? You better believe it. Uh, mm -hmm. This is Alex and I am still here. So thank you. And Senator Yoakum, I want to thank you for um, some of your concerns and, and thoughts previously. We were talking about funding. Um, and I think that that's a big part of it is not only um, paying these caregivers um, a livable wage or a wage that is going to incentivize them to at least stay in it. But I think another concern we have is the workforce um, and the shortage and people not staying in that. And one of the points that I've tried bringing up is that Iowa is a very aging state. We're going to have more and more people that are going to be receiving these services. Um, I'd just be curious to hear about your ideas of what we could do to address those workforce shortages. In addition to paying them a wage that may incentivize them, do you have any other ideas or any other things that we can continue to push and advocate for? Well, okay. So, so that's a great question. And am I on mute or am I off mute? I'm, oh, you're I'm good. Not, okay. You're good. You can hear me. Okay. So, um, I can tell you that Di Finley and her group have been working for several years, and I'm sure she could use your help. And okay, it's it's set up now. Okay, and anyway, Di Finley and her group, they have been trying to set up a system that would not only improve the wages of um, direct care workers, but also uh, make that employment um, a career level where it where you would were ed education based and. For example, let's just, I'm just gonna throw this one out. So you work in um, a nursing facility and you decide you wanna work with um, geriatric patients who have Alzheimer's. So you would go and get some additional education or training to be able to work with Alzheimer's patients. And therefore you, you have improved your career ladder. Now you're going, now you're actually making this an actual professional career where people can improve themselves, improve their skills, improve their wages. So that would be one thing is to tie into Di Finley and her group um, to try and help advocate for, for those kinds of changes to professionalize direct care workers themselves. When my daughter was still living, um, obviously she had intellectual disabilities. So I'm very familiar with some of these issues and some of the ins and outs of Medicaid privatization. Um, but we were very lucky because we had the same case manager for Sarah's entire life. But it was a real challenge for a lot of families. And I know part of the issue, as much as the care, the, they love doing the work, they just can't make it. So anyway, I just think that Di Finley has a good idea. She got a grant from the federal government to put this program together. Then Republicans, I'm sounding partisan, but I guess I am. Um, they wouldn't even take a look at it. So here we are, and I think she could use some help, and I think that would be one way to solve the problem. Let me go back to Sarah's issue on trying to find ways to make the ballot more accessible for people who are, who are hearing impaired or deaf. Um, I actually am introducing a bill. I was contacted during this season by people who um, are, are blind and we're also having difficulty getting access to the ballot and being able to exercise their right to cast a vote. And subsequently, I got a hold of the Secretary of State's office to see if they could make some changes by rule rather than wait for the legislature to convene and change the law. Um, could not do that. So I'm introducing a bill, but in the meantime, I'm now finding out that the Secretary of State's office is also introducing a similar bill. So there is an interest, um, at least from the Secretary of State, to try and make the ballot more accessible to people with, dis with different disabilities. So maybe what we can do is maybe um, see if we can't get inserted into that bill that the Secretary of State is introducing to, to deal with some of the issues that Sarah was mentioning on what we can do to make the ballot more accessible for people who are deaf as well. Just a thought, but it's a it bill's out there, it's getting drafted and we at least may have a vehicle. And of course the secretary of state's a Republican. So it might have a little better chance of passage than being introduced by a Democrat. Of course, I'll still introduce it, but anyway, you get my picture. Thank you very much for that. And, and you know, I appreciate you bringing a, a specific uh, 
um, issue or a specific, uh, you know, item to the table here. And, and that, that's actually very helpful for us as advocates as we look forward to the session. Um, you know, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, and uh, it's mm -hmm. really important for us to do that. So um, I do want to get into, um, you know, this, this idea of bipartisanship. I know uh, this is a Democratic Party function. However, um, as we know, we need to be able to work with some of the folks across the aisle to get some of our priorities through the legislature. Um, Senator Hogue, I want to bring you in um, on this. Um, and, you know, so, so what can be done since, you know, we, we hear our Republican, you know, friends across the aisle um, on, um, you know, they always talk about, uh, you know, the cost savings. I mean, that was the entire uh, rationale supposedly behind privatization. Um, a lot of those goals have not been met. In fact, uh, you know, as we know, the uh, the overhead is actually 12% when it used to be five and, you know, something's getting lost there. And uh, we, the, 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 the metrics that the governor and, and uh, the, the former governor set when they, they privatized Medicaid um, have not been met. So how do we move forward from here? I know uh, we talked a little bit about doing a bit of a piecemeal approach and, and um, you know, working in small steps. Is that what you view, uh, Senator Hogg, as the best way forward at this point? Uh, obviously, um, people with disabilities shouldn't be at the whim of who's in the governor's office for our health care. And um, so, so it's hard for us sometimes to accept that it's not going to be a, a wholesale change. But um, what, what, what would you say, what would you think is probably the best way to move forward on this uh, as we go for, as we work forward? Great. Well, thank you, CJ, for the question. Uh, Rob Hogue, uh, State Senator from Cedar Rapids. And thanks to the caucus for organizing this. Uh, thanks to our interpreters and thanks to our captioner and everybody who's making this uh, virtual forum work tonight. Uh, I just want to take one step back and just remind people that we really need a, a focus this year on ending the coronavirus epidemic and um, supporting uh, incoming President Biden in his efforts to get the virus under control because uh -huh. that's critical for our survival, our health, and our economy. We cannot get our economy uh, going again until we get the virus under control. Now, specifically on your question, CJ, and it is a very difficult question because we on this uh, panel tonight, we're Democrats. We want Democrats to succeed. And at the same time, we find ourselves uh, once again with a Republican trifecta. And so to get things done, you need to have Republican support. I believe that one of the models is what happened last June around the issues of police reform. The legislature passed police reform, Governor Reynolds signed it, and it was the Republican version of every issue that Democrats had put forward. It was Democratic leadership that made it possible for that issue to be addressed. And I want to I want to use that analogy in one other way, which is that was the product of a very broad movement for social and economic justice uh, and, and public safety by um, advocates who said what our state and what our country have been experiencing is not right. And so here's, here's my suggestion for this. Communicate what you need. Don't ever short yourself on what you need to try to get Republicans to agree. You need to communicate what you need, and we need to together build a bigger movement for social and economic justice. And if we build that big movement, it will become something that Republicans can't ignore. Now, that doesn't mean you just pretend like Republicans aren't in charge. You have to think about the short-term suggestions and craft those in a way that make it doable for Governor Reynolds and a Republican legislature. It has to be doable. 
but that that doesn't mean you you ever stop saying what it is that you need and put your effort into building an interconnected intersectional coalition of people who want um, social and economic justice in the state and the country. I think that's the way to move forward. And, and that's, you know, I'm sitting here looking at uh, a legislative session where how often will I actually be at the Capitol until the coronavirus is under control? Because I don't want to expose myself or expose other people. And we're not in the majority party, but where, where there's no restrictions and no barriers is building a statewide movement for social and economic justice. So uh, communicate what you need, be clear about it. Think about what you're saying specifically so that it makes sense, so that it's something that Republicans can act on but put the effort into building that coalition because together, if you take um, everybody whose who's future is not being cared for right now and you put us together into a coalition of people, that is a coalition that is unstoppable. And, and that's where I really think we need to put some significant focus of our time. And it's one of the things we can do with social media, with email, with phone calls. It doesn't require any of us to risk our lives uh, and expose ourselves to this deadly infectious disease. Um, so that's where, that's where I'm at, CJ. And I, I hope the caucus will, will stay actively engaged in that. Build your membership and build connections with the other uh, constituencies uh, in the Democratic Party and outside the Democratic Party who really ought to be Democrats. Of course, and and, and I, I really appreciate that as well. You know, and sometimes you have to look to, uh, and this is C.J. Peterson again speaking, uh, we want to make sure that we are um, remembering how that the, the way you say something is almost as important as, as what you say um, in, in many instances. And, uh, you know, that's a, one, of, one of those issues that is, uh, you know, I guess, uh, um, in, that, that kind of transcends political party, I think, is uh, is mental health. And um, so I, I want to seg into this topic. Uh, I, we're going to come back to uh, an issue that, that you uh, raised, uh, Senator Hogue, with uh, social justice and, and policing uh, here in a moment. But uh, I do want to bring in uh, the chair, chairwoman of the Democratic Party's uh, Veterans Caucus, uh, Shelly Savadio. Uh, um, as well as uh, we have uh, Bruce Beeston on, uh, who works with uh, with uh, some veterans uh, issues, um, and I, I really want to kind of talk about this in the context of COVID nineteen. Um, so, so with COVID nineteen, Medicaid uh, and veterans programs have a, a larger volume of work to do, and of course, the governor has put some uh, some extra money into mental health that came from the CARES Act. Uh, which really begs the question, you know, where were the governor's priorities before COVID and, and what would the state of affairs be in, in mental health without that CARES Act funding? Um, and, and shouldn't the governor, shouldn't, shouldn't any governor, you know, not just Governor Reynolds, be thinking ahead about the needs of, of Iowans? Um, you know, it seems like we, if I'm correct, we only have 10 beds statewide for uh, veterans, which is uh, for, for for mental health uh, uh, for veterans. Uh, so, so I guess uh, which legislative priorities, uh, Shelley, um, would you suggest we advocate for this session to help uh, veterans with disabilities? And and of course, uh, Bruce, uh, feel free to join in on this conversation as well. And I do want to welcome you both and thank you for joining. Good evening, and thank you for having me. So my name is Shelley Servadio Elias chairwoman of the Veterans Caucus of the Iowa Democratic Party. And uh, this is a statewide position. And uh, what this means is, is that we, um, I represent a voice of minorities. Uh, veterans are minorities. And, and 
Um, so I advocate for their needs. And one of the things that is actually the law in Iowa is mental health parity. So in the mental health law that we currently have, um, it doesn't even mention the word veteran. We're not codified under the law. So in the mental health care regions across the state, we're not covered, we don't count. And it's a very common misconception that all veterans go to the VA for their health care. Only about 30% of veterans actually go to the VA. But another thing that happens is a lot of veterans, um, when all wars, as they're leaving the military, they don't necessarily um, know that they're going to have something wrong with them that happened to them while they were serving. So maybe several years later, something happens mental health wise, like PTSD symptoms start happening. And then they have to go access care, maybe at an ER because something's happened, they're very sick, they're in crisis, but they haven't yet hooked up with the VA, but they need health care now. They fall through the cracks because we don't have them in our law. They're not covered. So we have um, in Iowa Code Chapter 225C under the Mental Health Disability Services, we really need to have some amendments um, and we need to go through appropriations and ways and means. And we need to fix that. We need to amend Iowa Code. And there is money out there. President Trump did an executive order where he said he wanted civilian and federal resources to work together to stop veteran suicide um, and to treat PTSD. So we just need to connect all the dots and facilitate handling those resources. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to start breaking down the stigma. We need to stop criminalizing mental health in our state. And we need to start um, mental health is just part of your body. We all have a brain. <laughs> we all have emotions. Uh, it's normal. It's not a character flaw. And if, if you need to go get counseling for something, uh, then you should go do it. Um, it. It's no different than like, say you're having chest pain and you need to go to the hospital and get that treated. You wouldn't think twice about it. And it's no, it's not a weakness to need help and to go seek it. But in our state, for some reason, we have deemed that as a weakness and we treat people very badly and we refuse to appropriate funding for it in the Iowa House of Representatives and in the Iowa Senate. And it's reprehensible. 75 veterans a year on average die in Iowa of suicide from PTSD. And every year we do nothing. And, and I've gone to the Capitol and I've educated our legislators. I wrote a bill, the Veterans in Crisis Care Act a couple of years ago, and uh, it got stalled out in the Human Resources Committee. Um, so since then, another 75 veterans died. And then another year later, another 75 veterans died because three people in a committee couldn't agree that we needed to amend a tiny part of Iowa code and add the word veteran and get this codified so that we could get Iowa hospitals paid for a 23 hour observation hold so that we can take care of people that are in crisis until we could get them funneled into the VA and get them a bed. Because on any given day, we've only got 10 dedicated beds for people that have PTSD or mental health care crisis. It's reprehensible to let people die. They can survive wars, but when they come home, they can't survive Iowa. We gotta fix it, guys. So that's about all I have to say. If anybody has questions, I would be glad to help, glad to answer them. Um, I'm glad to come to the Capitol and testify. I'm very knowledgeable about the VA, suicide, statistics, 
PTSD. I'm diagnosed with PTSD, military sexual trauma. I'm rated 50% by the VA um, disabled, and I am a veteran of the first Gulf War. Uh, I was the primary winner in Muscatine for district four County Board of Supervisors. So um, I've got a little experience in running for a, a, an election and listening to, to people um, coming and saying what they want from the Iowa Democratic Party. And overwhelmingly, they want us to fix our mental health, public health, women's health and access to health, systemic racism, bigotry and hate in our state. And they want us to fight for them. And they don't see us doing that. They see us not having a clear message and not staying on point. They see us all over the place and not being a cohesive unit and not having unity amongst ourselves. So until we fix those things, we're not going to win elections. All right. Thanks, guys. No, Shelly, I really appreciate that. And I think you brought up some great points. Bruce, I would ask um, in your experience, kind of what can be done to keep moving the needle forward or what other angles could we maybe take in this upcoming session that you would see? Oh, you're muted, Bruce. Ah. Uh, being a lobbyist, there's a, a method that we, uh, all of us in the veterans community uh, rely on, and that's uh, uh, seeing all of our uh, elected representatives, Timmy, you and I have had many discussions. Rob, you and I, we've also had many a discussion. Uh, and uh, once in a while, we even uh, resort to twisting an arm or two. But uh, it's uh, what, what the constituents and what us lobbyists tell, these, tell the people who are in the legislator, legislature, uh, you know, how we, hi, Pam. Uh, nice to have you part of our little group. Uh, what we do as lobbyists up there is we try to inform. And uh, we also do a lot of encouraging of, uh, of constituents to actually come up and talk to the legislators. Um, uh, because, you know, th they're the ones who have the stories. They're the ones who actually, you know, understand why a bill is up there because it's going to help their particular situation. Uh, I have seen this. I remember uh, one particular woman who was uh, who uh, lobbied up there for nearly five years to get a bill uh, passed on requirements for uh, uh, investigations into homes with the uh, uh, the gas that was causing the the, uh, the the gas from the soil that was causing uh, the cancer. She was a victim of that cancer. Her name was Gina. Uh, there are uh, people that come up there, uh, large groups of people that will come up there. Uh, the pro-choice groups, the pro-life groups, they come up as a group and they all, you know, they all want to talk, you know, talk at the same time. What we tell the legislators is, uh, you know, incredibly important, uh, number one, to the constituents themselves. But I think the, and I've been told by a number of legislators that they, they rely on what they hear from people. Um, uh, Part of what I do up there, I'm, I'm kind of the, one of the veterans guys up there. Uh, I'm a vet myself. Uh, I'm a disabled vet. I was, uh, I'm a victim of uh, that stuff they call dioxin, Agent Orange, and uh, uh, didn't come down with the problems from it until 30 years after I was discharged. Um, the, uh, one, of what, one of the things that I do is I work on veterans' health issues. Uh, I'm a legislative director for uh, Veterans National Recovery Centers, which is head by, headed by, by a couple of your, uh, one of your colleagues, Bob Krause. Um, but I'm also uh, doing representation yes. for uh, the state uh, uh, arm of uh, Vietnam Veterans of America. And uh, I have just been tapped to uh, assist with some of the national legislative issues for VVA. The national VVA president actually came to me and asked me to help. Uh, I do some work with also with uh, veterans of foreign wars. Um, one of the things that I do with them every year is before the legislation legislature begins, I get on an email to everybody. I have talks at, at the meetings when we can hold them uh, about actually getting the individual vets up there to talk to the, the uh, their legislators, talk to the people who represent them specifically. Uh, a lot of you have seen what we do with, uh, you know, Veterans Day on the Hill. Um, 
at uh, you know prior to uh, the caucuses, prior to the elections, uh, I'm very busy you know working with the individual chapters to get uh, our community out uh, to the caucuses. You know we're not specific which caucus to go to. I'm not allowed to do that, but uh, we you know encourage everybody to participate in their party caucuses and to get the heck out and vote. We uh, our community does vote and we vote in a pretty high percentage. Uh, and we, and part of what the reason why is because guys like me all over the country who are doing the same thing that is encouraging people to vote. Um, now that I've had a chance to be on the soapbox, I would like to ask a question of everybody. Um, I think uh, Pam, Rob, Timmy, uh, you guys can can really help a lot with this. Uh, what are you hearing from uh, the people? who are providing the caregivers for the disabled people. And I, I see one here in my, in my own condominium building, a gentleman uh, who is a retired JAG officer who needs all kinds of help and he is getting it every day. And uh, you know, I, I see what they do. I, you know, I see how hard they work. And uh, you know, I can understand why they have a heck of a lot of turnover with these companies for these caregivers. My question is, what have you heard, all of you heard Oh, excuse me, uh, from representatives of any of these firms, how hard it is to keep help and to find help. Because uh, it seems like, you know, they all have, you know, the, even the nursing homes have extraordinary turnover issues. And I don't know if it's all related to pay, if it's to the hard work, or if it's uh, a combination of the two. Please. So I'll jump in. Um, what I usually hear is pay and it's benefits sometimes more than the pay. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, yes, they are having a hard time hiring people. And that means that those who are employed are working sometimes double shifts mm -hmm. because they need to fill in, especially in a nursing home. If all of a sudden some of them come down with COVID and have to quarantine. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, actually the, the pandemic has made things even worse. Mm -hmm. um, than it was before. It was pretty bad before. Mm -hmm. the nursing home level, I think we had probably 40% turnover rate minimum. And it's not getting any better. Now, I know that some of the people I know um, that are that work with case management now, they're case managers. So that's a little different. So they're doing a lot of their work remotely. And I'm not sure how well that is even working because they aren't able to see people face to face to make sure everything is going well but it's usually a combination of pay and benefits because many times they don't have, they make just enough that they don't qualify for some of the public assistance programs for healthcare. They try to get their kids in the Hawkeye program, but it's usually both benefits and pay. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I asked is uh, I'm, I'm one of those weird ones up at the state house. I, had to wish, I actually went to business school instead of law school. And uh, one of the things I, I can't understand is, you know, why market forces haven't kind of taken over and, uh, you know, force these companies to actually increase the pay uh, that they're giving to these employees because it's, it's costing them a fortune to, you know, to deal with this turnover. And, uh, you know, they could be money ahead by giving everybody a raise mm -hmm. of 15 or $15 an hour and giving mm -hmm. them you know, healthcare benefits. Has anybody stated a reason why or heard a reason why? Um, usually, Bruce, it's because Medicaid's reimbursement rates are not adequate mm -hmm. and they've only become worse since we privatized because now the uh, Amer Group and the Amer, Amer Group and uh, Total Care, they, they, they have to turn a profit. I mean, come on, they're a private company. I get it. Mm -hmm. And their goal is to turn a profit. And the only way they can turn a profit is to reduce reimbursement rates, delay payment, cut services. And they're doing a combination of all three. So, so the privatization has only exacerbated the problem even more than it was before. And now you have the pandemic layered on top of it. That's why as much as I would like to just be able to take a magic wand and change all of this right now, mm -hmm. um, we have tried to do the big stuff all at once. And we always fall short because we do not have the power we would like to have to make that change. So I agree with Rob, we need to build that network of um, coalition building and create some kind of a movement. In the meantime, we can make some changes, but it's gonna have to be changes that we can 
um, convince Republicans that it's not going to bankrupt the system and that we can at least achieve something to start making some movement. Because it's very frustrating for those of us um, who believe in all of you and your rights and want to make sure that you're getting the services you need. It's just as frustrating for us as it is for you to think we supposedly have power and we don't. We don't have enough power to make the change that we would like to see happen. Is there anything you could do legislatively to, uh, uh, you know, regulate these companies a little a little tighter? I've never been a big fan of regulation, but the way I see these companies operating, I think they need a heck of a lot of it, a mm -hmm. heck of a lot of uh, regulation on top of them. The the best. Um, luck I have had so far is actually working directly with the new director of the Department of Human Services, um, Kelly, Kelly Kennedy Car Garcia. She's mm -hmm. actually been pretty responsive. And, um, and, and anyway, she has actually um, helped make some changes. So, so I would prefer to actually try and work with her and try and get some of those changes made through a department bill right now or through a rule change. But that's my own feelings on trying to get some kind of movement right now is working directly with the director. Mm -hmm. Maybe Rob or Timmy or, well, Eric probably wouldn't know yet. He's too new. <laughs> but if Rob and, and Timmy okay. might have some suggestions too. I agree. Director sure. Garcia has been very good to work with. The other thing, Bruce, when Pam was talking, you know, that I, that, that I was thinking of when I talked to these caregivers, because I actually work with a lot of caregivers that one-on-one um, -on -one is that they're they're treated like second-class citizens, that they they're not treated like this is their career, you know, um, and and so I think Pam touched on it earlier in the conversation is, you know, making this a career, making this something that these folks um, keep you proud to do, and. Um, you know, as Iowans, we, we mm -hmm. want them to be trained and qualified and to take care of, of, of us and other Iowans. And um, so many of them are treated as just as if, you know, they're um, and, and the interesting thing right now is that on my days off from the outpatient clinic, I've been working as a CNA on the floors uh, to help the nursing staff. And so I go there, not as a legislator, not as a manager, not as a therapist, as just a helper. And you can see how these folks are treated, um, but they are the ones pulling the work um, mm -hmm. and doing the job. And so I think we really need to change the whole mindset. And I love the continuing ed and making it a career choice and making these people proud, but also allowing them to pay their bills and take care of their families doing a job that they they very much love and I think we would we would you know reduce that turnover because they use now this career as a stepping stone to get a better job to pay their bills because mm -hmm. though they may want to stay with Alex because they love working with Alex they can't afford to um, so they have to move on. So once you get someone trained, um, and I have a couple of friends, high quads, once you get someone trained, you sure don't want them leaving you in two months. Um, but, but they will because they have to get an affordable job. So I think we have some areas and I think Director Garcia, I think I agree with Pam, that might be a, an area where we can maybe build that career, career for those folks in Iowa. So let me and go back, you. because you, I Carrie. talked about that a little earlier, and her name is Di, D-I, Finley, F-I-N-D-L-E-Y. And I really think that we need to work with her to, to build that new system to make this work, to professionalize it. Um, I don't see any other way to start making the kinds of changes we need um, to reduce the, the, the turnover and to improve wages and benefits for, for these workers because they're critically important. As mentioned, boomers are aging. There's mm -hmm. going to be a greater need than ever before in this state. Of course, of course. And, and thank you very much for that. Um, and I... Um, I, I, I apologize. Uh, this is CJ again. Uh, we're going to... Uh, I just want to make sure that... Um, you know, in the interest of time, we're, we're getting to... Uh, Hello? 
the uh, the, the social justice uh, and, and policing uh, topic here. Um, if anyone is interested in, in furthering the conversations uh, with the legislators and the panelists, um, we will be uh, posting the, uh, the the contact information for everyone on the panel. Um, so if there is anything you want to continue, any of the topics uh, and continue discussing those things, uh, we definitely want you to do that and we encourage you to do so in your advocacy. So um, one item that, that I, I really want to make sure that we, we get to here uh, before we close out with a little bit of Q&A. Um, and, and Raymond, I'm going to bring you back in um, and uh, Representative, uh, Representative Elect Charity. Um, so, so statistics show that about, you know, between 33, between a third and half of, of law enforcement uh, use of force incidents uh, involves individuals with disabilities. Um, and so obviously there, there are some some themes that are common, right? You know, there's racial justice, there's social justice, there's uh, a difference in how folks with disabilities are approached. Um, and so, um, Rima, I want to start with you here on this topic. Um, how do those themes of, of social and racial justice intersect with the disability issues in Iowa? I love intersectionality. I think it's so important for everyone to, to learn and understand. So, and I, I think you're, you're very eloquent on this topic. And so, uh, what changes are important to pursue and how do those issues intersect, uh, Rima? This is Rima. Thank you, CJ. Great question. Uh, so I'm going to answer this question and I, I, I want to just warn everybody that I'm, I'm going to tip a sacred cow, so to speak. I appreciate that we're having conversations about justice in these types of forums in, in a state like Iowa. Frankly, this is, this is unprecedented, but 2020 is full of unprecedented uh, moments. And so I, I, I'm honored to, to be able to be a part of this tonight. So justice, I wanna, as I'm talking about justice, I wanna contrast it with rights because we talk about rights a lot in the disability community. We talk about rights a lot in a variety of marginalized communities, including communities of people who are racially marginalized. And so here's where I, st I start tipping sacred cows. <laughs> The fact of the matter is this, rights are all about creating space for populations of people that were never intended to have space in the first place, period. Think about when this country was coming into being and the individuals that, that founded it were putting pen to paper and, and, and writing out things that, that are guiding principles for our country. They were not thinking about the disability community when they said all men are created equal. They weren't thinking about women either, were they? But they weren't thinking about the disability community. They weren't thinking about black people outside of the context of being enslaved. And so we've had to kind of after the fact create space and, uh, and, and retrofit mechanisms in this country so that marginalized people can, can, can do the best that they, they can as far as uh, navigating this country's concern. And the thing is, is this, you know, the people with, with the power have had the privilege to, to, to decide, oh yes, we will extend these rights to you or, or no, we're not gonna extend these rights to you at this time. And so that, that's a, a, a rather toxic dynamic. Um, and, and then when the power is bestowed, it's typically the most privileged members of a marginalized community that benefits from it. So I'm gonna talk about the, the statistic regarding um, one third of people who, who have violent interactions with police officers being members of the disability community. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the thing is, is that in the context of sort of bestowing rights to a marginalized community like the disability community, for instance, you know, ultimately, uh, the systemically speaking, what's happening is inherently ableist. And so justice is all about working beyond that and focusing on what's right, you know, what's, what's, what's burdened 
um, what's the most inclusive. And, and so that's a big reason why I appreciate that we're, we're finally having conversations about justice because just justice ultimately is what will create a truly inclusive society that has room for all of us, a truly intersectional society. So one out of three or 30% of individuals who have violent interactions with police are disabled. 50% of people who have violent interactions with police are black. 40%, according to the Department of Justice, 40% of people who are or have been incarcerated are people who experience a disability. And we are in a state that's that consistently is a top three state as far as incarcerating black folks per capita. So if you put all these, these statistics together, what you see is that a disproportionate number of disabled people, black folks, folks that are black and disabled are having these interactions with law enforcement that, that, are, that are violent, that, that cause incarceration, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that obviously is, there's, there's a lot, we have a lot of work to do as far as that is concerned. But until we shift our focus from, you know, constantly kind of after the fact, especially those of us who are advocates, you know, kind of doing an Oliver Twist, please, sir, can we have some rights type of dynamic at the state house? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're perpetually going to be kind of behind the curve as far as um, ensuring that the most marginalized amongst us um, do have access to justice. So the more, more marginalized a person is, the farther away they are from, from that nucleus of justice, so to speak. You know, the more likely that, that they are going to be underemployed, unemployed, or employed in, in some kind of capacity that uh, in, a, in a position that, that is looked down upon in society. You know, one thing that we never talk about is the fact that uh, among sex workers, a disproportionate number of sex workers experience a disability. Because the fact of the matter is, is the more marginalized a person is, the more on the periphery of society they are. And that that's not justice. And, and so, you know, I, 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 I offer all of this because the fact of the matter is, is that when we're having conversations about uh, police interaction with marginalized communities, there's a lot going on beneath the surface, you know, underneath the, the, the water, so to speak. There, the, the iceberg is a lot huger than it looks when, it, than we're, when we're looking above, above water. And so, you know, we, we all as a state sort of descended into a rabbit hole with regards to police reform and that kind of thing. As, and that's great. I wanna, I wanna offer a special shout out to Des Moines Black Lives Matter because it's an integral part of the, the coalition that, that, that worked to ensure that Governor Renner signed police reform into law. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is now, we've got to start having conversations about the real conversations about the systemic. And as we're doing that, we have to come to terms with the fact that conversations and focus on rights will only get us so far. We have to start, we have to continue the shift to focusing on justice from a systemic vantage point. That is what ultimately will create a society where things like police violence and, and other social maladies um, are no longer happening. That is extraordinarily important. And I, I, I do think that um, we need to see more of our leaders in the Democratic Party in Iowa uh, be able to utter the phrase Black Lives Matter, if I can say it in lovely white Western Iowa where Steve King, you know, got 90% of the vote all the time. I think most of, more of our, more of our uh, legislators can, can say it out loud and, and speak the truth to power there. So, um, and I think it's so important that we recognize that uh, that intersectionality is, is 
it, it's just part of part of life and um unless we are willing to talk about it and, and get a little bit uncomfortable because it is an uncomfortable thing i mean i for, for any of us who um you know are are more pri privileged than others you know it, it's not a comfortable thing to talk about our privilege but you know it's also uncomfortable as you know being a, a person who is a, impacted by by the systemic uh, injustices and um you know there, there's rights and then there's making it right and that, that's where we get justice and so um i, I thank you so much for that uh, rima and and i do want to um ask uh, it's my understanding uh, representative uh i like uh, jerry you um have worked in law enforcement uh, is that correct uh, is that my my is my understanding of my recollection correct there CJ, I'm not sure if he's with us any longer. I don't see him at oh, least. That that is perfectly fine. Um, so so as far as uh, legislative priorities, uh, do do you think uh, um, why why don't we uh, take a moment here for some Q and A? Uh, we we did have a section here on affordable housing. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're uh, if we want to fit Q and A in, um, I don't know if we can tackle that topic on this on this particular forum. Um, do we have some of those questions? Uh, you know, okay, perfect, great. So, um, first uh, first question from the Q and A. We're going to go ahead and do Q and A, um, and then uh, we'll we'll come back to. You. Um, if you have any any questions about any of these topics, of course, we're going to post the uh, contact information for all of the panelists. Um, so, what? Uh, there, this is a question from the YouTube uh, feed. Uh, what will we do about the soon to be disabled COVID-19 survivors? Uh, they will need full support for the rest of their lives too. Um, Kimmy Brown Powers, let's, let's start with you on this uh, question. Well, I think that's something that we're gonna have to address and we are seeing the side effects of COVID um, in our young to our elderly. So right now I've got a patient that I'm working with that is a long timer, um, young, healthy uh, individual who now is having some uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, questioning when and, and, and what kind of job they'll be able to return to. Um, if we get to return to um, trying to just get on top of some healthcare issues um, for this individual. So. Um, I think that these are the things that um, are not being looked at at this point. They're, they're thinking that, you know, where you get COVID, um, you're either going to get better or you're going to die, um, and then you're going to get vaccine, and we're all going to move on right back to our, our old, old lives. And that, that's not true. Um, our COVID survivors um, are going to be much like my cancer survivors. They are going to have a... Uh, a list of different things. They're going to have a new normal. Um, I always said my, my oncology patients have a new normal. These COVID patients are going to have a new normal. Um, and, um, and this includes our 21 year old athletes, our NBA athletes are, um, so all of these folks are going to have the new normals and, and CJ, this is something that we are going to have to address in the state of Iowa and across the nation, um, is what, what, care what needs um, are, are going to be required for these people. And I think, unfortunately, it is unknown at this point. Um, and I think as we go down uh, in three months, six months to a year, we're going to start seeing these side effects and, and, and conditions, and we're going to have to be working with those folks long term. And some of these folks I'm very much afraid are not going to return to their previous jobs, um, particularly if they had a high labor, high physical position. Some of those folks won't be able to handle that um, any longer. So I think that we are going to have, you know, not only healthcare, but economic, um, all of those things, education that we're going to have to be working with with our COVID patients. And I don't think um, most folks have a clue of what's coming. Thank you very much for that. Um, this question is for uh, uh, really whoever uh, on the panel wants to answer, but um, this comes from a comment on the YouTube feed. Um, it says, uh, I'm severely disabled with a trach ventilator feeding tube port uh, PICC line, uh, can't move or do anything for myself. Medicaid is trying to force me into a care facility, uh, which is 
uh, it is in Medicaid's best interest to help me stay in my home versus the cost of forcing me to live in a care facility. So this sounds like it goes back to that uh, original question of a medical model versus an independence model. But um, if whoever wants to answer here on the panel, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more on your thoughts on that. Actually, I'm going to have a hard time answering it because I don't know, I don't, I don't have enough information. Like, is yeah. this person able, I, I take it they have some in-home care coming in now and suddenly they aren't willing to pay for it or they had a family member doing some of the work and they aren't willing to pay them anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure where the problem sits. I was going to say. So, so what, I would, what, I would, what I would suggest then is maybe for the questioner, um, reach out to those on the panel who are legislators um, with this more specific uh, details. And I'm sure that some of the legislators or all of the legislators on the panel would be happy to come work into this and, and see what we what resources are available. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That would be helpful. Yeah, there are some very specific questions. And so we wanna just yeah. make sure to connect them with their elected officials so they can kind of go through and work through those questions. <laughs> I yes, of course. That many of the law, the many of the home health agencies, um, if that is a complex patient who needs a lot of care, uh, they were not getting their reimbursement. Their reimbursement got lowered with with Medicaid, um, and so they pulled out. We had three individuals in this area that got a month notice that said, "Hey, we're not going to provide your care after 30 days," and. And so those folks were scrambling and this individual might be in that. And so one of the options from uh, the Medicaid companies was, well, we can, we can put you in a nursing home. And uh, the, you know, those in, none of those individuals wanted to do that. So it, that could be what this individual is running into too, I'm not sure. Well, and I know, I know Senator Hogue wants to jump in and so I'm gonna let him do that, but I did just want to um, piggyback off of that comment. I mean, myself as a C5, C6 quadriplegic, I mean, my mom started providing my full-time care. Um, mm -hmm. And so she's been doing that throughout the, well, first when I was having trouble with the Medicaid and lowering my income and everything like that, navigating that, but then also then with COVID, it seemed like the smartest play rather than having anyone else come into my home. But due to COVID and due to staffing shortages, I keep in touch with the director of my local agency in Sioux City, the fourth largest city in Iowa. And she said, if I was trying to come on next month, they wouldn't have the staff to support me. So my mom's living with me full time, just trying to provide that care so that I can go to work. She, she had to quit other jobs to make sure to make that work. And I think there are a lot of other families in that same position, which gets back to our caregiver shortage kind of um, conversation. But Senator Hogue, I know you wanted to hop in. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to say that in a when we get to a post-coronavirus world, I know there will be people who have the ongoing consequences of it, but when the epidemic is over, the public health emergency has ended, we need to be prepared to have a very serious discussion about what we see that we want as a safety net and it's not just for some people. This is a safety net for all of us. Medicaid, for example, is a program mm -hmm. that works for everyone. And I want to have a safety net that works, that allows people to live with dignity, that meets people's health needs, housing needs, food needs. And we need to engage in that discussion. Also don't want to sugarcoat something we are going to be spending the rest of our lives paying for coronavirus relief, right? It, it, we, this has been an extraordinarily expensive uh, endeavor. It's the right thing to do. It should have been more. That would have helped us end the epidemic sooner, but we need to be prepared to do that so that we can have a safety, need, safety net that lifts everybody up. Uh, nobody nobody is immune from the consequences of accidents and diseases like coronavirus. I understand that some people are wealthier and can insulate themselves a little bit from these uh, forces, but I mean, I just pick somebody out. Herman Cain, prominent Republican, 
owned a national pizza chain, he gets killed by coronavirus. So I think we need to we need to really challenge Iowans to say, hey, we're all in this together. Let's build the safety net that we want so that nobody slips through the cracks and everybody can live with dignity. Uh, and I hope that I hope that can come out of this. So in response to the question, of course, we want to have programs that help people live independently and not get forced into care centers. Because that's what I would want if I was in that situation. I think that's what everyone would want if they were in that situation. So mm -hmm. let's lift, let's lift our safety net up to meet the aspirations of our people. Thank you. Of course, of course. And and I, that that's entirely right. And it just reminds me of a, a friend of ours, a friend of mine, um, and and a member of our, our of the disability caucus here. Um, after the derecho came uh, through, um, was struggling to find a uh, a generator um, because he he needed to use a ventilator, and mm -hmm. could not find. Ended up having to go to Missouri to stay with family because his care provider, you know, Medicaid or, or whatever provider he was using would not pay for a generator short term for him to be able to, um, to be able to breathe, literally to, to, to breathe. And I, I mean, this, this kind of preparedness or lack of preparedness, uh, that, that's one of the things I think, Senator, maybe you're, you were alluding to there, you know, the, the preparedness aspect of this, you know, we're just not ready. Um, for, we don't have a plan A yet. And so we can't even start on plan B or plan C. And, and when plan A fails, as it inevitably does, we end up in a situation where we have folks, you know, having to go out of state or, or taking away, you know, services or, or, or the ability for people to just to stay alive. So um, I know Julie uh, and uh, um, Eric wanted to close out this, uh, this forum here. Um, anyone who didn't get your questions answered, uh, feel free, like I said, uh, make sure you go ahead and contact the folks on the panel. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that, uh, you know, you get answered. Uh, you can email me or anybody here. Um, and uh, Julie and Eric, I do want to turn it over to you um, real quick uh, for, for a closeout here. Um, you, you two uh, do the most work out of all this. I, I just get to smile and ask the question. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you folks. I'm just going to say a couple words uh, and let Eric talk about his plans for um, upcoming training for being an advocate. You know, we've talked about all this and I'm really feeling like we have uh, a better roadmap in, ahead of us right now with all of the great input from the panelists here. So I want to make a plan and I'd like to have people sign up for Eric's training session on how to become an advocate. And I'm just gonna um, give them a chance to share about that. And I have a couple of slides also, also that explain a little bit more about the training. So, so Eric, you can um, talk about that and then I'll show the slides. Okay. Um we, as part of the Disability Caucus, we're planning on having an advocacy group that um, uh, creates an advocacy group that sends people down to the state capitol to, uh, to lobby for our policies during the session or the policies we'd like enacted during the session. So the next step will be offering uh, training prevented, presented by myself on advocating. Uh, we'll be talking about what you need to do and prepare and to know in preparation um, the various and different ways to advocate. Who do we need to talk to? I know um, Senator D. Yoakum has already touched on that with us uh, through different conversations before the session, uh, before this uh, forum got started. And we need to talk about how to talk to legislators and how to get connected to our legislators and stay connected and what you do outside of the state capitol when you're talking to the legislators back home and on what different various levels you can advocate, not just advocating with your legislators at the state capitol at the US Congress, but the other levels you can advocate for what people with disabilities need and some other things. 
So um, go ahead and come to our event that we're planning for the virtual training on how to be an advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Eric. I'm just gonna share my screen here and this will be, sorry. One button in front of the other first. Okay, so um, I would like to first of all thank Eric for taking on the trading session. Um, he's done this many times and I'm excited to learn from him as well. This is kind of a little bit new to me, but I'm also excited that um, Senator Yoakum has given us some really good input on how we can maximize our strengths by creating a core group of advocates that are willing to call, um, email and text legislators when bills are in committee, especially she noted or come up to a vote. So with all of this in mind, I think it's important to, um, first of all, know what bills that we want to advocate on are coming up and put this in, put this in motion to have our network do all this work. And as you legislators know, you, you pay attention to what people say, right? And we can add um, pressure to them with all of these things that we're advocating for. And we can also share stories of how the bills would impact the disability community. And this I imagine is gonna be those personal stories that sometimes maybe they're hard to say, may be hard to share, but without doing that, um, we're not letting people know how um, all of these policies are impacting us and how they could improve things. So it's my goal to be able to set up a, a network of core people that are ready to work on this. And for that reason, I'm sharing my email right here at the bottom, chair Aya, disability caucus at gmail.com. If you haven't already signed up um, through our Eventbrite registration, which would allow us to contact you. If you haven't already signed up, you can use this email right here and get in touch with me. That way you'll know about the training when it happens and you'll know about different legislative events. Um, probably Eric will talk a lot about this funnel um, very important to make sure we meet that deadline. Um, sorry. Okay. So anyway, uh, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It has been really, really a learning experience. And I think that everyone here would agree that we got a chance to really talk about things. And um, I think that we have a really good start on this conversation. Um, so thank you very much all panelists and all viewers that popped in with questions and our moderators. Um, you did a great job and I hope that we're gonna be continuing this conversation sometime down on Capitol Hill through emails, through calls and um, anyway, you you really made you really made our night with the disability caucus. Well, you made Thank ours you as well. Here. So, warm wishes for a joyful and healthy twenty twenty one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for 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 joining us.